try this out. All right, so everybody can see it and hear it. We are going to go ahead and record it. This is just going to be an introduction to Polar 3D and printing. And uh, just go over a, an overview of 3D printing and then a little bit specifically to Polar 3D. My name's Tom Dubik. Um, I'll fill you in real quick on why I wanted to do this webinar and, and why I'm really pretty excited about the printer. Um, I've been teaching engineering since 1989 at a prep school. Um, so really been doing a lot of, uh, you know, STEM work or design thinking for many years. And uh, through the years, you can see down here in the corner, my students sent the world's record for largest paper airplane. It lasted all of two weeks. Then kids up in Virginia beat us. But um, we've done a lot with LEGO EV3, etc. And we got involved with the Open Maker movement. Our classroom was the first to use Raspberry Pis in the classroom. We are the first to do Oculus Rift. And I also got very involved in their maker community. And through that, I got very interested in 3D printing. Okay. And I'm going to pop back and forth here just because the way the screen is set up. So I can see what we're getting here. Any we got everybody can hear me, I hope. Yes. Good. We've got everyone here. Excellent. Let's go back over. So um in any case, I was at a conference, National Association of Independent Schools. I'm still a classroom teacher. This is my 29th, uh just finished my 28th year, so this is my 29th year, which is amazing to me. But um in there, uh, we started using 3D printers for lots of reasons that you all do. And I saw a printer at NIS, and I saw the folks at Polar 3D and Bill specifically. And I looked at the design, saw it worked, found out you didn't have to level it, and uh, bought one right on the spot. Mind you, I've had two replicators, high rel and some other ones. Uh, high rel and uh, which is a very good 3D printer and the up plus twos very nice printers but we'll talk about later why I'm using it and more importantly about what's starting to emerge in terms of multiple printers whether or not you use a polar 3D something is starting to happen with multiple printers has got me very excited now the focus today will be on the polar to help those folks because everybody at this webinar um, I assume has a polar 3D Okay, now we're going to pull over real quick for a quick poll so I get to know you all a little bit better. If you would, I'm going to launch this poll and just get for the next one. How familiar are with you with 3D printing? All right. If we can get everybody else to vote up here, we'll be all set. All right, we got 95% voted. I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll, share the results with you. So we got 30% experience, great. Fill right in to jump in. 40% um, know about it, and we got a quarter of newbies, that's great. Okay, Amanda, your hand is still up. I'm gonna put your hand down a second. Okay, I just wanna make sure there's not a question. If you have a question, just raise your hand on this. All right, Margie's got her hand up. All right, Margie, I'm going to ask you what's the question. What's going on, Margie? Okay, Margie, go ahead. I'm good. I, I, I took I put my hand down. Okay, great. And we got, uh, let me see, Krista here. Yes, Krista. Got a yes. question? Do you have a question? Um, no, I think we just forgot to lower it. <laughs> no worries. No worries. All right, and then I'm going to put Ed Estes on. He's one of the folks from Polar 3D. Yeah, Ed. Hey, Tom, how you doing? Great, how are you doing? Doing great. Good. I Did you... think it was already there. I'm going to mute. I'll hey, mute. There we go. All right, there we go. All right. Let's go ahead here. We've got Margie. We've got, every... yeah, Christy Smooth. Um, Muted out. Ed, are you good or you got a question? Okay. I'm good. I'm just 
Playing with the hands. That's okay. Great. Okay. I'm going to jump back. I'll check from time to time over on this screen to make sure we're good to go. Okay. Now, let's go back down here. Okay. Since we have some newbies, just talk about this briefly, but it is important. Um, 3D printing is really aiding teachers to do design thinking. Or, you know, when they talk about STEM, let me back up a second. When they talk about STEM, we've been teaching science, we've been teaching math, we've been teaching technology. So what was really the big difference? Well, one of the big differences, we started teaching the engineering method. All right? We started teaching the engineering method, which has now led us, um, the idea that you come up with an idea, you throw out a bunch of different ideas, you test, iterate, test, iterate. And that engineering method is now evolved into design thinking so you don't have to just build things you can use the design thinking in a history class for example and real life problem solving well in STEM it was allowing oops thank you very much we got the poll results up thank you let's go ahead and shut those down thank you very much all right let's go back over here so in any case, it's the engineering method. And what's really important in design thinking or the engineering method is the ability to iterate. And that's to be able to quickly try out an idea, test it, or impre impre uh, and try it again. Reiterate it over and over again. And I think 3D printing allows you to start doing that when you get several 3D printers. That was the hope of 3D printers. Also, it allows you to start drawing things in the three-dimensional world in two dimensions on a computer which allows, again, is another way to iterate really quickly. Um, what would have taken that, uh, maybe you're trying to draw a cube by hand, you can do it very, very quickly on a computer, much faster than you can do by hand. So, for example, and it's already creeped into the real world, and this Nike prototype for, uh, for making shin guards, guards for soccer players, they're using 3D printing. And, you know, they found... For example, that could actually reduce materials be just as strong. We're seeing that quite a bit with aviation. By now, you've seen the critters out there, be it a turtle, be it a duck, be it, honestly, people using prosthetics using with a 3D printer. And that, to give you an idea on the uh, duck foot there, it took hundreds of hours to get to that point. And then we've heard about 3D printed car, it's, you know, a drivable car was printed in. And you have 3D printed housing. So, um, and it's being used in Africa right now. They're making a 3D printed bridge. We're using 3D prints to print cells and, uh, excuse me, tissues in the body. So you're seeing that everywhere. And so there's a real interest, I think, to bring it into the classroom. One thing I would like to say is that we need as we get more 3D printers, we're able to move away from teaching kids just about 3D printers and to using 3D printers to teach children. Okay? So how does it work? This will be just a quick synopsis of it. It's an additive manufacturing. It's the process of making a 3D solid shape of almost any shape from a digital model. All right? And... The basic process is use 3D modeling software. Um, we can, if time permits, we'll show you. I use with middle schoolers, I use Tinkercad, 123D Design, and with high schoolers, we use Fusion. And we'll we'll post all these resources later. But um, the software uses one, uh, Tinkercad for youngest kids, 123D Design with eighth graders, and Fusion. It's put out. All these are Autodesk products. They're all. Uh, free to teachers and students. There's other ones out there, some open source software, but that's what we tend to use right now. And what I really wanted you to get out of that, not so much the software right now, is the idea is you design this cup in some CAD software, computer aided design software. It's the cup is then sliced off and then sent to your 3D printer. And then where it's built layer by layer. And that's why we call it additive manufacturing. You know, and in the past, they did that with powder and lasers, all right? But it was layered printer, layer by layer. Um, they would put powder down, hit it with a laser. It was developed by uh, by NASA, uh, Chuck Hull, um, 
was the person involved with it and they needed it they developed 3d printers because they needed to make equipment tools parts on long space missions so that's what nasa's big interest was in this so again the material you're slicing it you're creating it virtually slicing in it and building it back up in the 3d printer this is opposed to um, a subtractive process. Think of a sculptor. When a sculptor chisels away, you end up with a finished product. Uh, we use CNC machines, a milling machine. I'd say if you have, we use this with a millable wax. You keep, you use, a, you basically remove material off this rectangle until you end up with your desired part. One of the issues with that of course is you get piles of scrap where with the idea behind 3d printing is we're just going to lay down what we need and we're going to use a lot less materials and so this am down here is additive manufacturing so you got a cad base model take an stl file that's the format we use in 3d printing the software is sliced your polar 3d printer will do that and then we build it back up and we end up with a finished product all right and we'll stop here for questions a moment here let me go ahead and jump over here real quick question do we have any questions folks if you have some questions go ahead and raise your hands okay back over here all right Here's why desktop manufacturing, which 3D printing is part of. If 25 years ago you had a student that wanted to design a new rubber ducky, the student would have to draw it, would have to take his drawings to a professional draftsman, CAD person. They would need to go to a lawyer to protect your idea. You would then take it to a company um, to make the duck. And one duck um, would have cost you a considerable amount of money from injection molding, probably $10,000 to mold that single duck. And um, you're doing this not really sure that your duck is absolutely right on. All right, so you might have to prototype it with wax. You might do different things. With 3D printing, we can do it all on our computer, on desk, what's called desktop manufacturing. And... What we're able to do is make the duck right on our desktop and iterate and make another duck and iterate. And then when we're really happy with it, then maybe we go back to traditional injection molding. Because you can't, with a 3D printer, you're somewhat limited to the time it takes to print something. A normal print set you're going to do in your classroom a lot of times are two hours. If you want to do something really special, it might be overnight. And from a, a teaching perspective, the overnight prints are just hard to do, and they do a lot of those. Um, this has changed. This ability to do manufacturing is really changing uh, the world. Just like there was desktop publishing. The only thing holding you up in publishing right now is your ability and your effort. We think that's happening for manufacturing, and 3D printers play a big role in that. Now, let's talk about the differences here in a moment. Um, and how a 3D printer generally works, you have filament, it's either PLA, and you'll have people talk about PLA, or they'll talk about ABS, or two of the most popular filaments. I think we're seeing more and more PLA, because it's a plant fiber product, used in 3D printing. Um, we had the good fortune of having, say, uh, seven 3D printers running in the spring. We now have 17 running. And if you run seven printers at once in ABS, you have to be removing the fumes or it just, there's a cloud because ABS is a petroleum product. Whereas PLA, you don't have that issue. So here's the filament. It goes through a printhead. The printhead melts it like a heated nozzle. It melts it and it drops it down. Think of a glue gun. All right. And, you know, they call fused deposition modeling. That's what you see normally, as opposed to powder and laser that you saw NASA star with, or you might see in industry. Most of the 3D printers that are for school use and home use use a filament that they melt, 
We'll talk in a minute a little bit more how that works. Okay. Let me jump back over. Any questions on this? All right. Hans has got a question. Let me go see if I can answer it. Yes, Hans. Um. Oh, I think he's talking to me. Yeah, I think I am. And if you're and you weren't didn't mean to, I'll just go ahead and mute you. No worries. Okay. All right. I'm gonna go ahead. Do you have a question, guys? Hans. Hans. I don't think so. No, I don't, I don't think, think so. Stream it to YouTube, which would have been a good move. All right. But, um, what was I gonna say? Be unavoidable. Yeah, it'll be unavoidable, but I mean, I am a credential multi-subject right. teacher, so I'm not qualified to teach junior high single subject degree. Exactly. So I'm in the K through six region. Right. And my last class was a third grade class. Let me sing with you. They got a 150 and the contract says you can leave when your students leave. And I mean, I know with her, with the, the understanding of if there's no teacher that is wanting to meet on that Friday, they should be able to be. Right, That's yeah. So Hans, Hans, so what's your question? What's your question for us? Yeah. I know what you're saying. You know, just because of Gina, we're going by that schedule. Okay, I'm not sure Hans, Hans can hear us. Yeah. Okay. Kind of lost Hans there a little bit. Okay, we'll come back to it. All right, if someone's got a question here, let's go ahead and make sure we don't pop it here. Uh, well, I should elementaries have access to this? Oh, I'll absolutely answer that question because elementary children can do design thinking. And I believe that all in my heart. I'm a constructionist. This is not really what we talked about for the webinar, but let me just share this with you because I think this is really important what you're, just, you're bringing up. The theory behind construction, we've heard of constructionism and constructionism, and that is if you give children the ability to design and make something of interest to them, they'll learn even more. And what you're teaching the kids are is how to approach a problem. It's not really as important to make what they're making as the process. And then as we tie, if you have multiple 3D printers in your classroom, then you can design curriculum just aimed at it. Right now with NC State and the Science House, I'm working on a project with elementary school kids. They're going to design signet rings. And the kids will design their own ring. They'll learn about the history of that ring. They will make a portfolio, be it digital or handwritten. And they'll think about the design and why the design is what it is. Then we'll calculate with the kids on uh, geometric shapes with elementary kids. With middle schools, if we do a project similar to this, we might be using ratios and scale. Then the kids will design their rings, print the rings out, and um, look at them again and iterate, improve the ring, think about how they might prove it, and do it again. Does that help? Let me go back over. Okay, and I'm not sure Hans left on that one, but that's okay. That's why we wanted you to get that. All right, no worries. Let me see. Okay, he's back. Anybody else have a question about that while well, I'm right here on that topic? Okay, let's go back over. All right, now. There's basically been two printers. The first printer we had was a Replicator 2, great open source printer. Um, we used it. It was a Cartesian printer. And then the Polar 3D is a Polar coordinate. And it gets to their coordinates. All right. 3D printers use coordinate systems to tell the printheads where to go in, in order to make each shape. So in a Cartesian printer, one that was very common. Um, is it can move to the left, it can move to the right, it can move backwards and forwards, all along rails, and then it can move up and down. So you've got the Z coordinate, X coordinate, you got a Y coordinate on it. 
Notice that requires then three motors. Whereas a polar 3D printer is Cartesian. Um, it's not Cartesian, the, it's polar coordinates. Sorry, learn how to talk. So what happens in that is we need a motor to move it up and down, just like the Cartesian. Because think of a 3D printer like a glorified glue gun, like I told you before. And if you moved it, let's say XY, because everybody understands XY coordinates. We moved it to we make a line going across the x-axis and then we pull our hand up just a little bit more and we glue another layer of uh, with our glue gun and we pull our hand up a little bit more we would slowly make the line thicker and thicker all right they all do that what's different about a polar is this a Cartesian uses these xy coordinates and a polar uses an angle and this distance to layer it down all right so Remember, if you're standing on a grid, you have your X coordinate and you have your Y coordinate. So then all you need to do is think about that Z coordinate. Slowly keep raising it up. So layer by layer, this additive layer. Whereas in a polar, you're, you're, you have a distance you have to worry about and an angle. All right? And you tell, you basically, we're going to tell this mirror to spin and then we're going to count how many steps to take forward on after it spins. All right? Now, the advantages of this, and you've got a Polar 3D right now, and what I really liked in the design, because it's a very simple design, it's elegant. Um, because there's fewer parts, it's less likely to break the motors. But um, one of the nice things right off the bat is you don't have to level these. Okay? Um, as you get into 3D printing, you, if a print fails, it's often, you know, was the temperature right for the filament you were melting, you know, applying? Was the surface, was the adhesive put down, whether it's blue tape, whether it is uh, hairspray? And then is the plate level? On a Polar 3D printer, you don't have to worry about the plate being level. Uh, as a, a tip for those of you who have a printer and uh, want to mention this right now, I've been very successful spraying and when I say successful, 19 out of 20 prints work. I would say spray the mirror with lots of hairspray in the morning and then wait for 15 minutes, okay? So wait for 15 minutes after you do that. So it's you want it sticky. You don't want it wet. I also preheat it to 180. We'll show you in a few moments how to do that. I think if you do those things, you really avoid a lot of the problems. The hairspray makes it so your print will stick to that mirror. Preheating it to 180, we then test it to make sure we get good flow. We're going to take the PLA with our hand and push it through the print head. And by the way, my students do this. We uh, have a big belief as you get more 3D printers, you set it up so your students can use them. And it's in, and you know, in terms of repairing jams, our students maintain and repair our printers. Um, we start that with the 8th grade. We may or may not do that with the 7th grade. And all of our high school students can't use our printers. Understand, we went, originally we had, like most people, one or two printers. And what we were frustrated is you could only print a small item. Everybody in the class got one small item. Well, are you learning about 3D printing? Are you learning how to use the design thinking and really coming up with some solutions? And... We noticed as we added printers and we got to six and seven printers, our students really started getting excited about it. And as the price of 3D printers were coming down, we knew there was a real, we were excited about what we started seeing in the classroom. And then I can say this summer, um, we did a lot of summer camps and we had anywhere from 12 to 15 printers running at one time. And it was very exciting what the kids could then iterate every day and really make changes and see the design process. All right. Now let me go back, see if someone, anybody has a question before we go over there. Anybody have a question? Raise a hand if you have a question at this point. We're all very quiet. All right, there we go. Marcus has got a question. Great. Thank you, Marcus. What's your question, Marcus? Hey, uh, so my question was just about choice of software. We, um, We've been heavily using printers in the upper school, and we've been using Inventor. Right. Um, you mentioned Fusion. Was there a preference there, or why the? Well, the Inventor's got a cost to it. 
I got no problem. Uh, Inventor is a very strong program. And I just, for the reason why we use Fusion is because of the cost. And Inventor runs on PCs, and we, we're a Mac shop. And we're a Mac PC shop. Uh, I, so Fusion is basically one step down from Inventor. Like, we have Kinder Tinkercat for the younger kids, and we've got one, two, three design. But No, I would say uh, Fusion's more like Inventor. It's a pretty powerful, it's more in the AutoCAD category of stuff. Okay. Um, to give you an idea, have you ever, have, have you heard about Enabling the Future? Yeah. They use, they recommend to use Fusion 360. They use Fusion. Okay. So it's a, it's the real deal. It's a commitment. Folks, um, I can show you Tinkercad. Down the road, we'll have another webinar. For example, if you want to learn Tinkercad, in 45 minutes, 30 minutes, we can have you using Tinkercad. And then one, two, three design, a little bit longer. It's got some new features. Uh, Fusion's a bigger commitment. But the nice thing about Confusion, and we'll show it in a minute if we get a chance here, is they are, if you go on iTunes University, they have three great, um, they just came out this June. Uh, they And they look really great. I'm going to be trying them in the classroom here in another two weeks so I can report how it went. We'll supplement their curriculum. But they have design thinking, and that would lie out itself very well to go with a 3D printer. Okay? Anybody else? Thanks, Marcus, for the question. Anybody else have a question? We're going to get to Polar and some software in a moment here. All right? All right. Now, let me show you one other thing on this. To give you an idea, to show you what we do with our kids, and I can share this, and we're going to keep improving because we, you know, this is our first few iterations. We have a maintenance quiz with the kids. We actually, um, they have to pass this before we use a 3D printer because with, if you get to the point you have six, ten printers, you have to have the students helping you out quite a bit. Um, or you're just going to be spending a lot of time maintaining printers. And that simple design makes it possible. I, I don't think um, my Replicator 2 would have lent itself well. You can't open the heads. Let's just take a quick look at this. Right here, if you look at this 3D printer head, there's a sc screw here, screw here. Uh, they can be opened with Allen wrenches that come underneath this printer. You loosen it here, you loosen that off, and you can pull that plastic thread out. And the key is just make sure that's 180 degrees and it'll stop the jams. So we literally have the kids go through the process of spraying the mirror. Yes, it's a mirror. Yes, they could drop it and break it. You can get a replacement. Um, so far, we haven't dropped them. I'm the only one that's dropped the mirror, by the way. And um, what we'll do in the morning, as I said, we heated up the 180. I will have the kids pr push, this example, this example here says, purple PLA, I'll have them push through it so I know they have a good flow. And they get a feel for what it feels like when you're pushing through it and when you've got a jam. And then once you have a jam, and particularly with our high school students, you're expected to repair the jam. All right. Any questions there about repairing it or having the kids do it? Yes, Jim. Let me unmute you here. Jim, can you type your question? I don't can't seem to unmute you. Or you've muted yourself. I can't get you unmuted. All right, he's got a question. Let me go ahead and pull that up. Oh, yeah, someone says, yes, love your research. Are you willing to share a letter, including uh, links to iTunes? I will share all of that. I'll put it up. In a few moments, um, we're going to run a little bit long with this webinar. People can say, if you can't stay, we'll go ahead and um, I'll put it up there. But if you join as an educator, we'll be loading these references up throughout tonight. Okay? I'll put the iTunes University. I think I already even have it up there already. Okay? Oh, Jim's got a good suggestion. Jim's giving us a suggestion here. Mention ZCal. As it's important to preparing base and laying down successful layers, um, in terms of calibrating it along the z-axis, um, I may put Ed on here in a moment to talk about that. 
Jim, I've not had to do much of that. We literally will lay it, we will push it through the filament, and we've not had to calibrate it off that z-axis very much. I'm curious, are you are you all calibrating your z-axis? Let me let me get Ed on here in a second. Hey, Ed. Second. Ed, hey, you I, probably can hear me. Hey, Tom, what's up? Hey, yeah, um, can you hear me? Yes. What you're finding, and with Wait, other you're teachers, you're with, well. We got to mute you some no, way. I'm, I'm going to mute. mute. You. Can you mute me a second? Yeah, or mute yourself. Thank you. I'll ask a question. Um, how often do you think uh, most of the schools are having to do the Z calibration? And it may be you may tell me, hey, a lot of schools are doing it and getting better success. All right, I'm, I, I'm, I'll mute myself, or you go ahead and go for it there, Ed. Or you can just write me an answer would be great. Yeah, the, the Z calibration. All right, I'm going to. Yeah, the, the Z calibration, if you're using a hairspray, typically you don't have to change. Uh, that's that's calibrated from the factory. Um, the latest version of the software allows you to adjust it, but what happens is those calibration settings are saved with the printer so as long as back to your point about using the same mirror that came with the printer, um, you know, you shouldn't have to recalibrate it uh, just because uh, mechanically it stays in the same calibration over time. All right, thanks, Ed. So that's what I found. But, you know, right now I'm reading what um, Jim's saying. Hey, it might have been a rare occasion. He needed to do, but it worked. So we're great. Oh, yeah, Mark is making another good point. And this is really a good point. Those mirrors are unique to your, each of your printers. So you need to make sure when you have multiple printers, they're labeled. We went ahead and put blue tape on our mirrors, and we wrote in the print, you know, the serial number on the mirror. And they come with a sticker that says that. And we also wrote the serial number on the front of the printer. So it's pardon me, really easy for the student to match the serial number. If the serial number's not in front of that printer, you don't label it, then the student's got to look behind the printer. I think it would be a good idea. All right? All right. So a couple things there. We now have the ability to calibrate the Z-axis. Jim found that it worked. I think for the most part, you don't need to do it. That's why this ability that the Z-axis is calibrated at the factory is why I bought one. Because... There's three reasons a 3D printer fails, in my opinion. Just, just my simplistic answer. One, the surface doesn't have good adhesion. Two, it doesn't have the right temperature. Three, it's not level. Well, we just got rid of leveled. So now I just got to worry about that temperature and did I put on enough hairspray. And now that PLA is coming in carbon fiber and... and um, uh, conductive and magnetic, there's no reason not to be using PLA. All right. Any other questions on this? All right. And I will put up the maintenance quiz for you. All right. Let's go back over here. I'll tell you what, let's, with the time we have, let's go into the Polar 3D. All right. Let's get here. I'm going to go right now, um, but pull it right there. All right, so here we are. Um, we've already got a printer pulled up. It's right here. I'm logged in. If you go to Polar Cloud, I'll show you right this for newbies. If you type in Polar 3D, go to this home. Um, what you go ahead and do is select under about polar 3d and go to polar cloud now you can see about polar 3d um, they have a polar ambassador program if you promote it and then we're going to have polar challenges down the road now if i go to polar cloud i'm going to see something like this and here's my educator side of this all right what i would say if you have it now what would be great what would be great is if you can go on right now, and I'll stay on with you, and um, log in your Polar Cloud and ask to join the Educators Club 
and then I'll put the resources and you'll automatically notice. Plus, I can show you how to la add people to a club. Think of a club like a class, folks, or your school, and, um, and show you how to manage that. All right. Um, let me see. I exercise caution with serial numbers. Maybe I add a secondary label. This is Lori saying this. May students at my school could take over local Wi-Fi control quickly, given the access to serial numbers. Good point, Lori. I'm not. I'm really worried about that. But you're right. They are a hotspot. They could take it over. Um, it would have to be in that room. But you know, we refer to ours as YAOT one, YAOT two, etc. Plus, I think serial numbers are small and are easy to make a mistake on. So I think that's really good advice you just gave. Okay. Um, also, this is why I love webinars. I learn as much as I give on these. Uh, Mark has pointed out PLA prices have dropped to match ABS prices. And there is a one slight study saying somewhere that ABS could possibly be a carcinogenic. You get rid of that issue. There's nothing proven. That was just thought. So... I'll tell you what, folks, if, you'll, if you're not a member, go ahead and log in, create a profile. They won't hassle you with any kind of trying to sell you anything. Um, the Polar folks aren't going to do that. Go ahead, raise your hand if you've got a um, profile that you've got an account with them. So that way, especially if you're a newbie, we can go through and, and walk you through a little bit about how you would add up a print. And if it's okay with everybody, we're just going to keep going along here a little bit. So raise your hand. We've got about a third of us that have got an account. So leave your hand up. So that way I won't move forward until I know we've got everybody registered there. All right. Oh, okay. Where's the educator club on Polar? So what I do is if you go up to clubs, you can find more clubs. Click on Find More Clubs, type in Educators. All right. Let me see, Educator. Well, why am I? There we go. I've got invites right there, and it'll start popping up. So there we go. I approved him. Okay. You should be on the club there. Sarah is approved. All right. I think I've got everyone on here. This is not updating quite yet to say those messages were answered. Okay. All right. Here's what you've got to understand. Everybody's got different clubs, so you won't see it unless you look. For, you do that filter, search for a club, or find some clubs on there. Here we go. Hopefully that is this approved. Let me see here. Lori's been changed. There we go. Okay. We all set there. So if I go to my educators club, let me go back to educators. I have different ones. I have ones especially for Charlotte Latin. So there's a club there for my school. I could have it for the upper school and middle school because we're using those and elementary. It's a K through 12 school. Um, we have an enrichment program, Young Engineers Today. I'll have members of the club there, so you can put it in anyone. The educators is really just to get like-minded teachers at Polar to um, be able to talk and share and do things. Okay? Let me see. Is this. Lori's found it. Great. So everybody's found it. Okay. When you go to a club, you have projects, objects, and printers. I'm going to stay primarily in object printers and form. Here's say the form down here. So here's different, here's examples. Printing tips for the classroom, CAD for the classroom, curricular materials. 
All right, we're going to be adding more and more of those. Here are the objects. And I upload my STL files to that. And let me go ahead and join that. I'm going to go ahead and prove it. All right. Okay. Now, so if I have a file, an STL file, again, STL files in the format that Tinkercad has, 123D Design, uh, SketchUp, you can get, if you use SketchUp, you can make that into an STL format. You can, um, Fusion has it, most anything that's printed to a 3D printer. Thingiverse downloads everything in STLs. Okay. Now, so it's we go ahead and we can upload into that collection or your own personal collection. You don't have to use an educator's club. Make sure that if it's for your students, that you would uh, you would send it into your very own club. Right now, um, they're the folks at Polar Three D and, and Ed and Greg. If this is wrong, make sure you let me know immediately. We'll put it out there. But they're working on the ability that you send a spreadsheet, and if you send it to them, they'll upload it. So if you have a class, you say, I want this all to be part of a club. Here's the email addresses. They can create everybody for you. So you don't have to, um, you know, everybody doesn't have to by hand. You don't have to put every student's name in there. All right. Now, um, let's look at, there's a couple different things we get there. So let's go to club home. Let me show you a couple things. All right. So here's club summary. And in here, you can see all the different folks that are in the club. There's actually more. And it describes what's going on there. Number of printers. You know, here, it's I guess it's saying nine. It's I think it's been updated. So I think we have more than that now. Okay. But up here, for people that are doing this, sometimes it's hard to find. Here's the invite section. If you want to invite me to a club, I'll gladly join your club. Um, you go to invite, and you invite me to it. All right? All right, we have a question. I'm going to go, uh, let me see. I'm going to put everybody's hands down now. Are there any questions at this point, what I've showed you so far? Okay, so let's go up here. All right, so let's go to Amanda. We'll go ahead and approve. Sometimes it'll, sometimes it'll just stick a little bit. Like I'll approve somebody, it takes a little while, because when I do teacher workplaces on this. All right, and then for those clubs that you have, that you're running, when you go to, um, you can add managers yourself. They have to, just so you know, you have to invite them into the club, and then you would make them a manager. If you notice, I'm the only manager right now in this club, in the educators club. It, it, another teacher, I would have no problem making a manager. You've got to be careful about your students managing it. All right? And I think that's you, that's you just obviously have to be careful because they can control everything into the club. Someone mentioned earlier, hey, take a serial number and they could hijack it, which is true. The 3D printers, if they're not hooked up onto your network, not hooked up to USB port, they act like a, a print server themselves. And... You'll, you'll get there, you'll see their signal on your Wi-Fi, on your list of possible uh, connection spots on Wi-Fi, and you could connect to it. Because there's certainly, the kids are going to certainly Google Chrome how to set up my Polar 3D printer, and they would see that. Not been a problem at our school so far. And one of the reasons is, uh, this is just a general policy. When you're, we have a, a fab lab at my school. We're in the process of putting a fab lab together. So we have uh, associated with MIT and Fab Academy. And, you know, if a student would do that, they would just lose all privileges to the lab. And the only person really getting hurt is them. All right. Doug, who's been involved with this from the very get-go. Hey, Doug, how you doing? Good. Good. You got something to add? Yeah, I just want to point out, I think it's important to have students run their files through NetFab to put them up. And which program is that? Net? What was that again? NetFab. Can you can you send me that and I'll put it on the resource thing so people will have it? 
All right, I'm. I'm th <laughs> We're, I, you're you're breaking up, Doug. You're breaking up, but from what I've heard you say, especially for young users, that will help clean up and avoid, you know, bad prints. As a po okay, um, so if Doug shares that with me, I'll share that with everybody else. See, what, it, what Doug's getting to is part of this, and, and Doug will correct me, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, is a fab lab like a makerspace? Amanda, yeah, it's the, I think it's the gold standard. It's associated with Fab Academy, which is created by MIT. Um, you know, the training, if you join the Fab Academy and you do the training you should really have, is very extensive and very demanding. But, you know, it's a, and you have to have a certain level of equipment to call yourself a fat, part of the fab lab. Um, what Doug is talking about, and when we do Tinkercad, we do a webinar on Tinkercad, the kids can draw something and, oh, thank you. The kids can draw something. Here we go. He's got something for us. Ed's posted something. They can draw something in their Tinkercad, and I can do this right now, and while it would appear virtually like it would work, it wouldn't print. Um, it might be below the mirror. Let me go ahead and see if I can pull this up. I'm going to go ahead and copy this. Send the chat. All right, I'm going to send this to, hang on, everyone. I just put this up for us. Oh, that's the wrong thing. Try this again. Bear with me one second as I copy this for him. Control copy. I'm going to send this all out. You're all going to get a link, right, folks? Look in your chat box. There you go. So you have that. Okay. Now, let's go back here. All right. So we we're in our club home here, educators. And in there, and what I just, all I was trying to get to is, there's your members, the parent club, manager, you add your managers, and you can set your privacy settings. And we're not going to take time to do that right now. You can go through it and see what apl is applicable. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. For the newbies here, another reason I like this printer, and it'll blow up here in a minute, We're going to pull up a print right now. I like the fact that you could print something and see it right on your screen. I'm not touching any of the uh, settings. This is an actual print going on. If you're on your local area network, it even shows it more real time. Um, but you'll see you can, in your classroom, see everybody's prints that way. And you can also do things where I can look at the printers and do this. Now, realize, folks, I've gone home from school. Most of my printers have been turned off. We haven't started class with my own print. But I can sit down there and look at all the printers we have that are working, for example, we take them on and off. Most of mine are shut down, but you can see they're all, and you see they're all disconnected. That just means they're shut down. Okay? Um, let me see what else here we got. Let me got a couple more questions here. Yeah. Um, Amanda, I've got a whole list of things on what is a Fab Lab and a Fab Academy. We'll put that up as well. I And, and again, um, as far as that goes, too, I do a lot with Arduinos, Raspberry Pis. Uh, we do molding and casting with our 3D printing. All that stuff I'll share with you. All right? Now, let's just go through the process real quickly. I'm going to go into Tinkercad here real quickly since we're talking about what how we would print something. Alright, so say I'm working with Tinkercad. I'm going to go log in here. Again, if you join Autodesk, it's free. They seem to do a pretty good job of what the curriculum materials are making. Okay, let me pull this in. Alright, Doug's got... I'm going to unmute... 
speak here. Oh, he's he muted himself. Put your hand down there, Doug. Any more questions? And I would Amanda, I really encourage you if you've got the resources and they'll give you the time and the support. Um, I'm very impressed with some of the fab labs I've been to. And, and the real key thing on a fab lab and a makerspace for that matter, it's not the, the not the equipment. The equipment's really important, but it's the resources of people. That's what makes it. Now, um, so here's just some of the designs. If I search through my designs here, you can create designs, search designs. Let's say checker. I'll go ahead and do that. Here's all the checkers. We do a project where our kids design checkers. And then we mold and cast them. So we're combining old technology with new technology. And what's been great, now that you have the price of printers come down, they're becoming super reliable, you can let the kids all design their own checker. And they have time to redo it. Because this checker will print uh, hour, hour and a half. So if you can imagine, if you've got six or 12 3D printers, you could still print out a lot of checkers. You know, have the kids work together to come up. And what you could do is, with Tinkercad, all the kids virtually can design their own printer. and But they can work in groups and decide which checker they like the best. They load, download that. They print it off the printer. And that's what they're going to mold and cast with. But say I have this beach checker, which would not be the best checker. Let me get some decent checkers here. All right, here's a group. If I wanted to, um, all right, copy of checkers or something, Batman, Superman checkers. Here we go. I'll tinker this. Let's go right here. So here it is. It's showing up on my checker. I look at the size. I make sure my dimensions are correct. If you know, if it pushes through this blue, you'd be messed. Um, it wouldn't necessarily print well. And again, this is not to teach you Tinkercad. We've already been here now almost an hour. We don't have time to Tinkercad. But I will just give you an idea how we would work this. We would download it for 3D printing. STL. And then I would go to my Polar Cloud. I would go to Objects. I would make sure I'm in the cloud I want to be in. Uh, invite Mike. Got another printer. And join Mike. Approve. Bear with me as we approve these. Okay. Now, here we go. So say I want to upload that checker and print it. I want to make sure I'm in the right uh, club. So the right collection, I can get to it, but it's easier if I do it that way. So I go into Objects, I upload STL. And let me get, that's Downloads. It should give my Mac a minute here to labor along. Okay. Okay, let me go to desk. Let me see if it's on the desktop. Hang on one second. Oh, it should be on my download. Make sure. I'll look at my desktop here. Bear with me one second, folks. Everything's a little bit slower because of that. Okay, great. Let's go to downloads. It should be there. Sometimes I don't like the new Mac they date everything so now because it wasn't dated it wants to I gotta pull it down here oh come on no date here it is so I just open it up there copy of Batman Superman checker Tom Dubik kind of a long name we can get into when we um, use the software some naming conventions so there it is there's the printer that's what I'm gonna go ahead and print all right, so now there's my object. Load to a printer. So there I select through all these, one of our printers, for example. Um, I'm going to just say 11 because I don't believe anything's 
It's going to ask, do you wish to manipulate this object in a power cloud before printing? I'd say no. Well, down the road, we really get into printing more. We'll talk about that. But that's basically you're using the software that comes on the 3D printer for manipulating it. And especially large files, you don't want to do that because of speed. And I honestly, I just use my Tinkercad for doing that. So then I would have my printer and I would it would load up. Now it's in the print queue. It's ready to go to be printed. Now, if it was in the morning, I would have sprayed my glass and I would change this temperature setting to 180 and check out my PLA. All right, someone's commented. Got it. Oh, look, I think. Scroll to the bottom of your download as it doesn't have a date. Yes. I was trying to do that, Ed. Not very well, by the way, but thanks. All right. Now, we go ahead. We sprayed it. The glass isn't tacky. Or the glass is tacky. It's not wet. Temperature's 180. I push the PLA through it. Then you're ready to go ahead and try it. And you just hit start print, to be honest with you. And it'll print it all the way out. Don't be surprised if the temperature was at 180. I'm not going to change it right now. This is 130, but I don't believe it's that. I'm going to go ahead and hit it. That was what the last time we ran it was. Um, what I guess I'm getting to is you'll have it at 180. When you start the print, it'll drop down a little bit, but then it'll climb back up. All right. So, and you can select any of your printers. This is my printers. Those are printers to me. My current club. And then all my clubs. So I have all these printers that might be. And there's lots of different printers here that would be on. Um, down here's a forum. Up here is forum for your club. Let's specify the difference here. Here's the forum for your club. All right, thank you very much. And then here is the Polar Cloud support forum. And, you know, they keep it pretty updated. So if you post a question on there, I think those folks try pretty hard to get you an answer. I've even called them and they picked up the phone and answered. All right. And then down the road, they hope to have challenges. Okay. Now we've already gone well over the time we have. I would just finish this up with um, that you can show your kids we'll have it and I'm really, I'm really pumped when I'm using this with lots of kids. I'm very excited about these moving from, if you think about computers when they first came in, we taught kids about computers, then we used computers to do what we were already doing, and now we used to do, now we'd use computers to do things we couldn't do any other way with a computer. That's going to happen with 3D printing. And you're going to hear design thinking is a big buzzword, and this will be part of that. All right, any questions on that? All right, Krista. Okay, I'm I'm gonna unmute you and then you unmute yourself and then go ahead and ask your question. Go ahead, Krista. Okay. Um, can you change the fill percentage in the polar cloud? Can I change the what per, the fill percentage? Yes. Actually, you can in the um, settings on this. Let me get to a printer where we can start looking at that a little bit. Um, let me do this. If you go, hang on. Let me go back to a printer. All right, let me go to one that's printing. I don't want to mess it up. Okay. There's share a snapshot, printer controls. If you go in, and I don't have it because this is printing from a different location, I can go on to my IP and I can get control. You can get a manual control, and in there you have options, and in there you get the fill settings. I can't show you here. We'll do the next one. The, what I'll do next time to show you how to do that is I'll set up a printer right here at home on my uh, local area network so I can demonstrate that. Okay, Krista? I hope that's not a complete answer, but you can change it. She's muted herself there, so we'll let it go with that. 
So if you go to your IP, it'll give you manual control, and in there you can you have all these advanced settings. All right. Okay, another question here, another quick poll. Just give us an idea so I know on launching this. I'm so, like I say, I teach at Charlotte Lanton, affiliated with North Carolina Science House, do a lot of teacher training. The project I want to tell you about real quick, something you might be interested in down the road. What we want to see is, at our schools, is how do you utilize it? So if you bought a bunch of these printers, how can we get them out? And not every classroom can have, you know, 12 printers. So what we're investigating is, as a uh, science teacher resource, you know, what happens if you give a couple printers to a school and then we use a 3D printing pool, a pool of 3D printers? Or you're a school, uh, you know, a couple high schools, you know, how do you go about utilizing that across several classes, uh, several schools, excuse me. So what we're doing is, we're developing a 3D design, uh, excuse me, design thinking and 3D printing. It's right now going to use curricula, it's going to be cross-curricular. So I talked about that in the beginning of the signet ring. You design a signet ring, we talk about the history of that, we write about it, we do some math affiliated with that. And what we're going to try and investigate is, if they have two printers in their classroom, using the Polar Cloud and Tinkercad and some of the software, we want to make it so from another location they can access up to 20 printers. They'll then submit their designs to the teacher. The teacher will upload it to us. We'll print them and send them back, which has got to happen quickly because we want the kids to look at their printed items, see how they can improve them, um, see if their math was their estimations were correct with their math, write about it, and then make a new iteration. Send it back. We print it again and send it to them. We're investigating the feasibility of that in terms of how labor intensive is it to do that. Does it make sense for schools? What I will say on these printers is you can pick them up with a handle and I've not had any problem moving them around. All right, I'm going to put Krista, if you'll unmute yourself, you can add another question if you'd like. Does anybody else have a question? All right, I'm going to launch. All right, here we go. Don's got one. Go ahead, Don. Don? Yep, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. What's your question? I'm just curious if you had any problems hooking the printers up to the school, your school's Wi-Fi. All right, here's what I do. Um, my school Wi-Fi, like a lot of school Wi-Fi, isn't the greatest. So I use um, uh, Ethernet. I go straight into Ethernet. So they're all wired in? Yeah, I just wire them in. Okay, thank you. And I found that's been the least hassle. Now, and now you can, and you can, if you've got enough, if you've only got one or two of them, you also can hook up through your USB port on that if you want. But having them hooked into the Internet and is, is really makes it nice. But you could go just through the USB port. Okay? Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, let's go ahead. Let me launch another quick poll here. I promise you I won't be beating you up on this. I'm going to go ahead and launch this. All right. If you're interested, what would you be interested in if we did another webinar here? Kind of getting a sense of what... Okay. Interesting. All right, with 93% of the people voting, we'll go ahead and close this. Three, two, one. Everybody's posed, closed, voted. Let me share the results. Um, 3D printing curriculum, I think that's what a lot of folks are, so we'll start sharing some of that out. Printer repairs, tips for the classroom, 71% seems to be the next one. And design thinking. And I should learn how to spell it. Uh, you know, paying for the printers is just grants and summer camps and some of the things we're doing there. It was fairly gets it out there. But um, thank you very much on that.
Okay. Let me do one more here. Okay. All right. Any other questions then for today? All right, when you leave, they'll give feedback. And please make sure you fill that out for me so I get a better sense. All right, um, Jim, you've got your hand raised. Can you write your question down so that way I can see it? Awesome, Chad. would love to learn more about casting process. Marcus, definitely will show you that. Um, thanks, Donovan. Jim, uh, great. Well, please let us know when you have the recording link. I will do that. Uh, perhaps off my email, I will show you that. Part of it is we're doing this so fast. I'll give you a link to recording when available. Um, and I will put it up there on um, YouTube as well. So you have a link to this recording, and I've been recording all along here. Um, part of it is we're going kind of right on the edge of this. So I will send you the presentation slides and how we're doing it. The um, signet ring and stuff will be a little more formalized. But the molding and casting and checkers, I'll show you that. Does anybody else here have a, a Fab Lab member of Fab, a makerspace in their school? Just curious. I'll write back with Ab. Because we love working with folks. All right. Okay. If there's not any more of that, you can see right now something they're printing over there at, at the folks... Polar, I'm not even sure what that is right at this moment. Looks pretty cool, though. I can't get over all the different materials you can print. We built our own. All right, Marcus. 11 printers, oscilloscope, and some power tools. Yeah. I, I've got, um, i got to get an oscilloscope. That's one thing we haven't bought yet, and I'm going back and forth on so how, how much woodworking materials we have. The Fab Lab, they list what you have to have, and then you can start adding it. We're using a... I'm using an other mill, a shop bot. I got a uh, very nice fusion laser cutter. I'm very excited to tie that in with with this. But uh, you know, we're we're really very excited. All right, Don, do you have any other? Your hand's still up. You may have just been that Wi-Fi question. All right, let me do, if you wouldn't mind, let me do one more thing. I'm going to manage polls and ask you a quick question. I'll just create it right here. Bear with me. This will be the last thing, guys. All right, last thing. Okay. Let me go ahead and put that printer details up. Uh, let's go ahead. Last poll, guys, and then we're done. How did I do? All right, thank you very much. Just so I always share results of any polls I do. Okay. Thank you all. Again, if you've got comments, please share them with me. I'd like to get them. We'll improve it. All right, we got to hit that show. I should say show. It shared the results. There it is. All right, everybody. You're welcome, Marcus. I appreciate sharing it. Oh, nice, Lori. Building a dream lab, design, robotics, engineering, art, math. Absolutely. And we're taking the training, and our art department's going to be involved. We really envision the Fab Lab being part of, more like a library where people come in and work on things. Hey, it has to be Ed rated you fair. Keep the good work, guys. All right, thanks. We definitely appreciate any links and resources helping to build Tinker Makerspace. We'll do that.
Have people type questions and send them to me. Mate. Thank you for the information. I will do that, Krista. You're welcome, Laurie. All right. Talk to you later. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Thank you for all the great information. Thanks, folks. Appreciate the patience on doing this. You're welcome. Take care, all. Folks, I'm going to shut this down now then. No other question. Quarterly Wehrmeyer would be good unless you think monthly is needed. You bet. All right, I'll think about it. I mean, we'll look at it and see what we've got there. Bye, Jim.